Wonderful. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, St. Mark's for our service of evening worship. Uh, last week, we began looking at the book of Nehemiah, and we're going to continue uh, looking at the second half of the first chapter, um, this great prayer that we find in this first chapter of Nehemiah. So Steve is going to be sharing on that later on. And just to say, I'm not sure anyone's joined us yet, but we've got the live stream working and I can see one or two people beginning to, to come onto the live stream. So if you're following us online this evening, uh, welcome to you as well. Uh, before we hear from God's word, we're going to worship together. Um, in the book of James, we are told to draw near to God and he will draw near to us. So let's just take a moment to pray and ask God uh, to bless us and to draw near to us this evening. Father God, we thank you, Lord, so much for your love for us. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your forgiveness that makes it possible for us to know you and to, to share uh, in your presence and in a relationship with you. Lord, we want to pray that you would be with us this evening. We want to pray that by your spirit, Lord, you would come and be present amongst us. We pray that you would stir up faith within us, that we would seek to draw near to you, trusting that you will draw near to us. Lord, we look to you. Pray that you be with us now. And so as we seek God to give, Together, let's stand and sing. Good evening, people of St. Mark's. Many years ago, I was involved in a uh, church holiday club, and the theme was Nehemiah. And we did a song called God's Our Builder to the theme of Bob the Builder. We will not be doing that this evening. <laughs>
Father God, we do thank you for the promise of renewal and strength and grace and hope that we have in you. 
Lord, as we are gathered in this place this evening, we do pray that you would renew each one of us, that you would enable us to receive your love afresh, to receive your grace afresh, to be reminded, Lord, to be mindful of your goodness and to put aside our fear and our doubts and to seek to draw near to you. Scripture says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We'll just take a moment or two of quiet now and I would uh, just encourage you just to, in your own heart, just to honestly acknowledge before God uh, those things in your life uh, that have not been right and that you would seek his forgiveness for. We'll just take a moment of quiet to reflect. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Lord, in the quietness of this place, Lord, we acknowledge that we have sinned against you. Lord, that our lives are not always what they should be. But Lord, as we each one of us in our own hearts acknowledge those things that we um, have got wrong before you. Lord, pray that you would also enable us to receive your forgiveness, to know that you will purify us, that you will cleanse us. And Lord, we pray for your help to live renewed lives that honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to turn now to our our passage and our sermon, and Steve is going to come and share with us now. Good evening. Uh, lovely to see you all. Uh, thank you for those leading worship, especially. Uh, let's turn to the book of Nehemiah. First challenge is, can you find it? Um, it's, uh, it's there. Um, I haven't got the church Bible. You'll have to work it out. But uh, if you're struggling to find it, um, it's one of the history books. And the way the Old Testament goes is you've got five books of the law, uh, and then you've got a whole chunk of history books, and then you've got um, uh, some poetry, uh, songs of Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, and then you've got the prophets. Uh, so if you open the Bible and you find you're in the prophets, you've gone too far. If you've got to Psalms, you've gone too far. If you're still in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, you're too early. See if you can find it. Um, it will come up there, easy to find on the screen. We're going to pick it up from verse 4 um, of chapter 1. Uh, Sam introduced us to the book last week, uh, but we just looked at the first few verses to sort of set the, t set the tone. Um, and there will be a little bit of overlap with one or two of the things he said last week, but I'm going to read from verse 4. This is Nehemiah speaking. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands. Let your ear be attentive. Let your eyes be open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. 
We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, the decrees, the laws that you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instructions you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the furthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah sits down and weeps. When I heard these things, uh, the things which he's just heard is that Jerusalem, the wall is in tatters, um, and the people have lost their way. Nehemiah himself is in exile, uh, but the news from Jerusalem is grim. Uh, destroyed walls uh, and people faithless. Um, the destruction of the city reflects the destruction of God's people. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. I wonder when... Uh, you last had that sort of reaction to hearing some news that you sit down and are heartbroken, maybe even shed tears. I don't mean necessarily bad news that we might get on a personal level, like the news of bereavement, but perhaps when we hear news um, on, the, on the television news or radio or in the newspapers, something that we find just too awful for words. This week there was news of... Um, details of the brutal death of a five-year-old at the hands of uh, his parents and other members of the family. Uh, there was even today the news of this terrible bombing of a school in Ukraine, uh, another atrocity in this unfolding war. And there was bits of news that each of us find gut-wrenchingly painful. Sometimes the newsreader or the reporter will say, uh, we want to warn you that this film contains upsetting scenes, um, almost as though those of you who can't handle it, just switch off now uh, because we risk upsetting you. I wonder when we've had that reaction of really being almost overwhelmed by the sadness of a situation. Well, Nehemiah is overwhelmed by the sadness of the situation of Jerusalem, um, and it's, it's for all those reasons of defeat, but it's also national shame, um, and as we go through his prayer, maybe some of his tears are also to do with a sense of responsibility, uh, tears of repentance, perhaps. But the story of Nehemiah, which we've just started and we're going to uh, carry on over the next few Sundays, uh, is, is a story about revival and about recovery. But it's a story which starts in tears. This genuine deep sadness and grief that Nehemiah feels about his people and about Jerusalem is not just a one-off uh, sort of bursting into tears and putting himself together. Because he says, uh, for some days I mourned. I, I continued weeping for some days and I fasted and I prayed. And we'll come to his prayer in a second. But uh, we touched on this a bit last week, this idea of lamenting. Uh, a lament over a particular situation. Um, he's, he's not gone straight into the prayer of saying, God, save us from this terrible situation. There's a sense in which the situation has to be grieved over, lamented. Um, and maybe there's uh, something about recovering that sense, as Sam said last week, of, of, of this idea of, of the appropriateness and helpfulness of simply lamenting. It's not whinging, it's not complaining, but it's actually just sort of stating our grief and sadness about a particular situation. And as I was thinking about this, I was remembering that um, uh, a few years ago, I was involved with um, uh, a, a sort of national lament. Um, I think I've mentioned to a number of you before that I've been involved for some time with an organization called Synergy, which is a sort of Christian network uh, seeking to 
get some joined up responses from churches and Christian groups and charities uh, to respond to the serious youth violence, particularly in London. Uh, the number of young people who have been killed at the hands of other young people or seriously injured. Uh, serious youth violence. And uh, along with others in Synergy, we from time to time have meetings and networks and various initiatives to try and uh, just keep that issue on people's radar uh, and to keep encouraging different responses. And just over three years ago, uh, we were moved to organize a rally in Trafalgar Square. Uh, some of you were there and will remember it. And I remember people saying, what's it for? Is it a protest march? And you know what a, a protest march or demonstration is like. What do we want? And you say what you want. Um, and then you say, when do we want it? Now. And, you know, and it's normally a protest against the authorities, maybe the government. Um, and uh, people take to the streets for their particular cause. And people said, what, are we, what is the answer to? What do we want? Uh, what, uh, who are we targeting? Are we saying the government should do more? Or should, what, what are we, what are we, on the streets of what are we in Trafalgar Square for? What are we rallying for? What is the 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 motive? What is the the cry? And I think we said really it is a lament. Uh, it's not particularly pointing the finger at a particular organisation or the government or the police or or anyone else. It's uh, it's a lament saying we are grieved, we are heartbroken at the loss of life. And we don't want it to be normalized. We don't want it to be just seen as, yeah, that's that's London. That's young people. That's what happens. People get killed. Um, and it's a lament. It's a pouring out of, of pain at heart. And I thought I'd tell you a bit about this. But then I remembered, um, rather than telling you about it, there's a little video. It's about five minutes, um, which maybe captures something. There's a few interviews in it. But what I want you to sort of realize is the people you see in Trafalgar Square, in this little video we're going to see, uh, perhaps we just, oh, it's already queued up. Look at that. Um, it's, this is what I think is a sort of, um, in some ways, uh, a demonstration of lament. So let me uh, just hand over to this little video for a second. Jaden Moody was just a schoolboy of 14 when he was stabbed to death Shortly last night eight in a targeted on Wednesday attack. Night, the teenager was the victim of a sustained and targeted It was a hundred yards from the site the of the latest of the teenage killing, the fifth fatal stabbing in a, a week woman in her South 60s London has died horror. and five others have been injured in a knife attack in central London on Wednesday night. people were killed in the first four months of 2018, and in the same period last year, on average, Just someone is killed week, every three days in the city. Boy became one of the latest victims of knife crime, following a year in which 17 teenagers were stabbed to death in London alone. We read the newspapers, we hear the news on the television, see the news on the television, and we hear about uh, these, these killings. But this week, it was very close to home for us as a family, because just a few yards from my son's school, uh, a young man was stabbed to death. And I realised that these are not just isolated things, they affect us all. It's not just the families that are affected, it affects uh, whole communities, affects schools, affects the teaching staff. Enough is enough and, and this violence needs to stop. Too many young people have been affected, too many families have been affected and I think it's time that we work together as a Christian body to put that message out that we are here to support the families, not just in prayer but actually to give a positive message out there and actually to pool our resources together to ensure that we tackle this public health epidemic, which is what we would call it, um, in the right way with a multi-agency approach. People have been robbed of their normality. Their lives will not get back to normal. And it's important that those of us who are concerned for the well-being of the community, churches working in partnership with other agencies, do whatever we can to reach out and try and give a message of hope to people in distress.
Come, Holy Spirit, they may speak for us. And come, Holy Spirit, that you may open their eyes and open their hearts of the ways of Jesus Christ. Come, Holy Spirit, here in this wonderful capital city for all who are involved in the Greater London Authority. Come, Holy Spirit, we pour out upon Sidney Khan and his team. This is about the church taking some place in offering a space for people to come, but also to, to offer them hope for what we can do as part of not just churches, but just the community coming together to offer ourselves, our buildings, and the possibilities for our young people. What's brought you here today to Trafalgar Square? Well, we're concerned about what's going on and we want to make a change. We want to be part of the change taking place. So yeah, that's why. It's not just somebody else's problem, but we actually, um, we, we make the difference. You know, as followers of Jesus, we're, we're to bring hope, to bring love, to make a difference to our communities. I think relationships are the key to change. So building relationships, a relationship between a trusted adult and a young person, that is um that's where change happens yeah so i think that's on all of us we can all do that we can all build relationships with young people around us as a nation we've got to do something to change land climate the government's got a lot to do the has got a lot to do and we can't lay the blame at any particular group we've got to work together we've got to be a holistic approach um, you've got to have the right people sitting around the table discussing this. It can't just politicians, it can't be ministers or preachers, it can't just parents. Everybody's got to come together. Yesterday, I was asked by a priest if I would encourage him to form a boxing club. Now, I come from and when I was a young man, boxing clubs based in churches were very popular. We even produced one or two champions like John Conte. But this was a way of giving an alternative to gangs. Give young people something healthy and disciplined to belong to, then there's a chance that the, the attractiveness of the gang will be replaced by something creative. a one-minute wonder in Trafalgar Square. We are determined that we are going to do something that's going to have a major impact on this generation of young people. Come on. We are not poor, we are rich. We have got resources. And we want to share those resources so that we can see a difference in our nation. It's not the government. Is not the police, is not the mayor, it's about us, the church, and it's about us together. It is not the Catholics, it's not the Anglicans, it's not the Methodists, it's not the Prismatic, it's not the Pentecostal, it's the church. It is the church, the church of Jesus, and it's together we will do it. I think that the key message we want to send out there today is love your neighbor as yourself. Um, don't just think this, this violence is somebody else's problem. It's all our problem. And we all have um, an approach that we can bring to this issue. I just pray that more people would get involved in this. More people would volunteer th their time and their evenings uh, to reach out to uh, the need that is, that is all around us. Coming here today kind of makes me, it reminds me of growing up in London as a little kid. I was free, I could do what I, wanted, what I wanted to do, I can jump on a bus. I want that back in our society, and I think we can help young ones actually achieve that. Live in a society where they're not afraid, they're not scared, they're able to be who they are. Young people with a lot of passion, a lot of energy.
Thank you. Okay, I just thought it'd be easier to show you that than try and explain it to you. I mean, what was happening there really in Trafalgar Square, as I said, was really a lament. Yes, in some of the interviews, there were some answers suggested. Uh, I know a lot of you sat up quickly when you thought there's going to be a boxing club starting in church and you want to sign up for that. Um, so there were some answers and suggestions about what could be done. But primarily, what you were looking at was, was a lament, a national lament, which included um, many of you will have recognized Les Isaac speaking there, uh, saying about the responsibility of the church and saying, actually, we bear responsibility. There was a sense of confessing and repenting of our neglect of young people, our failing of young people. Um, and in some ways, there's a parallel to Nehemiah's prayer. Nehemiah is lamenting over the national forgetfulness of uh, the national wandering away from God's ways. And uh, it starts with this sort of sense of mourning, this sense of grief, before he gets to these are the answers, this is the solution. And that's what I believe uh, we had an example of in a sort of modern day lament in that uh, rally, which I've just shown you. <clears throat> um, I was reading a bit about this uh, during the, the pandemic. Uh, in uh, the early days of the lockdowns in March 2020, um, just as coronavirus and lockdown was being sort of, as we were beginning to just sort of understand what a massive global impact uh, the virus was going to have, uh, we could hardly take it in, I think, at the beginning. We hardly, no one could work out what the time scale would be, um, how many people would die, uh, what it would mean for our daily life. Um, and Tom Wright, um, a theological writer uh, was writing that actually, as we were being plunged into a sense of uncertainty and, and darkness in many ways uh, through lockdown and through other restrictions, perhaps um, he was saying we need to recover this biblical tradition of lament. Uh, we may not be able to explain it. We may not be able to give answers to why is this happening and, and how will it all end, but simply to, to lament in the way in which the Bible does. And he said, um, lament is what happens when people ask why and don't necessarily get an answer. It's where we get to when we move beyond our self-centered worry about our failing and look more broadly at the suffering of the world. And he wrote an article uh, developing this idea, and he suggested that really the church needs to get back to praying the Psalms. Um, so many of the Psalms are, oh, God, what's happening? God, we are upset. God, we are mourning. God, we are in pain. God, we are struggling. Um, so many of the Psalms are prayers of lament. It's a useful prayer book of how to express and frame our laments. And then Tom Wright said that actually the mystery of the biblical story is that God also laments. Um, there's a song we sometimes sing which has that line, break my heart for what breaks yours. Um, and as we lament, we realize that actually God too is in pain at the loss of young people's lives in London through, through serious violence, um, that God is also lamenting. And in lamenting, we come into the heart of God himself and we are sharing, if you like, in the emotion of God in the way in which he feels. A lament is not self-pity, but a, a sort of turning to God and sharing his grief and distress at people wandering away from God and bringing upon themselves destruction and judgment. So let's look at uh, Nehemiah's prayer. It is a prayer of lament, uh, which is really preceded by weeping. And I, I'm guessing that actually he would have been praying this through tears. Uh, he says he went on mourning and praying for days. And then he begins the prayer. How does it begin? O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands. Let your ear be attentive, your eyes open. Um, it's, it's always worth noticing how so many of the biblical prayers start by remembering who God is and what God has done and what God is like. Uh, I think sometimes when we are urgently praying, we simply say, God, help me. God, I need this. And we jump straight in to the plea, straight into the asking, if you like. 
And it's not that we are buttering God up and complimenting him uh, and to try and ingratiate ourselves with him and, and by being polite, then say, uh, now will you help me with this? I think it gives us a basis on which to pray. Uh, as Nehemiah recalls uh, what God is like and who God is, that he's the God of heaven, he's the great and awesome God, he's the one who keeps his covenant, he's the one who sees and hears, all of those things he's listed out about God, it's almost as though that builds his faith. If God is great, if God is, is awesome, if God keeps his promises, if God sees and God hears, then I'm praying to someone who has substantial uh, power and influence. And um, sometimes I've discussed with people um, the pros and cons or the, the, the positives and negatives of liturgical prayers in prayer books. Sometimes I meet people who say, no, you should never use set prayers uh, because that's somebody else's prayer. You should just pray from the heart and pray what you want. And there's, there's uh, uh, some sympathy I would have with that view. But nevertheless, I think a lot of the prayers in the prayer book which have been written can be really, really helpful. Uh, because they've been thought out um, and they can actually, we can actually pray a prayer from the prayer book and think, yeah, actually that, that is exactly what I wanted to say. And what I love about uh, the prayers, some of you will know that uh, in the prayer book, there's a special prayer for every Sunday of the year. It's called a collect. And today is the fourth Sunday uh, of Easter. And if you turn to the prayer book, the collect for the fourth Sunday of Easter uh, reads like this. It says, Almighty God, whose Son, Jesus Christ, is the resurrection and the life. Raise us who trust in him from the death of sin to the life of righteousness, that we may seek those things which are above, where he reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. What I want to point out is whenever you see these collects or these special prayers, there's nearly always some little description of God right at the beginning. And so it doesn't, uh, if you say, what was the prayer? What was the real request in that prayer? It was raise us from the death of sin to the life of righteousness. But the writer of the collect doesn't say, God, raise us from the death of sin to the life of righteousness. He says, almighty God, whose son Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. So the God I'm praying to sent Jesus to die, to rise, and to live forever. So the God I'm praying to, even in that little phrase, I'm reminding myself, I'm not buttering God up or complimenting him, but I'm reminding myself the God I'm praying to is the God of life and death and resurrection and eternal life who's acted through Jesus. And therefore, the thing I'm going to ask him for is... I have some confidence, I have some faith which has been built in remembering who God is and what God is like. And that's exactly what we see in this prayer of Nehemiah. Um, so uh, he says, he remembers who God is and he prays to him. And then he says, please hear my prayer. Uh, let your ear be attentive. Um, let your ear be attentive. Let your eyes be open to what I'm saying. Please listen to me. And then he says, I confess the sins. We know what's on his heart. God, it's about the walls. God, it's about the wandering away of the people. God, it's about the loss of identity and uh, the lack of our national uh, adherence to God's laws. But he starts by saying, I'm remembering who God is, what he's like, what he's done, what he's promised. And actually, in the light of that, I'm a sinner in need of repentance. I confess the sins. And he confesses on behalf of the nation. In a sense, that's what we were doing um, in Trafalgar Square. And those who were leading the prayer saying, we are not pointing the finger at a particular group. We are saying, we confess that there are ways in which we have failed to provide for young people or failed uh, collectively as parents or collectively in nurturing youth and children. And Nehemiah says, I confess the sins. And he's not saying... I'm confessing the sins of the nation. It's a collective fault, but not me. He says, no, and me, and me. I have also uh, wandered against you. We have acted wickedly. We have not obeyed commands, decrees, and laws that God gave uh, your servant Moses. The law given to the uh, people of Israel through Moses, summarized in those 10 commandments. Um, I was talking about the 10 commandments in a primary school this week. And it was wonderful that uh, I was able to say, how many of the Ten Commandments can we remember? 
And out of the primary school children, um, uh, from years uh, reception to year six, uh, we got all of them. Uh, we went, uh, they were able to, to think of each one uh, between them. And there was something encouraging about uh, the fact that they knew them, or together we were able to, to collect them all up. Um, and Nehemiah is saying, we know the laws, but we have not kept them. We've wandered from them. Um, and so there is a humility, there's an honesty, and there's repentance. And the repentance really goes with the lament. As I say, the lament is pouring out his heart, but also, say, pouring out his grief for his own sin. And then uh, after the confession, uh, he says, none of us are exempt from having contributed in some way to the catastrophe. Uh, we've all played our part in wandering away from you. And then he says, uh, let me appeal to God's mercy. Remember the instructions you gave your servant Moses. He's praying really uh, from, uh, from the book of the law, really saying, look, I remember you said to Moses that if the people are unfaithful, it will be that they... They reap their own rewards. They will, um, they will, if they wander away from God, it will end up in disaster. They'll be scattered among the nations. And that's what's happened. That's why we are scattered. But I also remember that you said, if we return, if you return to me and obey my commandments, then even if your exiled people are at the furthest horizon, even if the people have been scattered, there is still hope. Because Moses said that God says, I will gather those from there and bring them to the place I've chosen as a dwelling for my name. He appeals to God for mercy. He remembers uh, that there is that open door. There is that open invitation to come back. There can still be a way back to God. And so he remembers that. And then he says, um, let me talk a bit about the people uh, we are your servants, your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength. You've done it before. You brought us. He doesn't mention exactly what he's talking about, but I'm guessing he's thinking about you redeemed us. You brought us out of Egypt. You gave us land. You have worked in our favor before. You have blessed us. You've done these things. Do it again, God. And then he comes to the conclusion of the prayer. And uh, he says, um, oh, Lord, let your ear be attentive to my prayer, this special prayer. And to the prayer of your servants, there are others praying who delight in revering your name. And then he comes to the one specific request that he's going to ask God for. And I find this really interesting. Um, he says, give your servant, i.e. himself, success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. So this man is King Artaxerxes. So presumably he's praying and saying, there he is. Give me favor with this man, with the man I work for. I am the cupbearer. I'll have a chance to be close to him. Give me success. Now, do you see that on the one hand, what's on Nehemiah's heart? He's praying for revival, uh, restoration, recovery, all of that, that big thing. Uh, but he doesn't actually in this prayer say, God send revival. God, miraculously, let me get to Jerusalem and find the walls have sprung up again and everything is back to how it was. Uh, that's what the end game is, if you like. That's what he's hoping for. That's what has distressed him, that the walls are broken and the people are broken. Um, but he doesn't actually say, God, mend the walls, mend the people. The actual specific request is, help me in the conversation I've got to have with the king. And Maybe you know that prayer, and I think it's also a song now. Uh, Lord, send revival. Start with me. Um, send revival is a very big prayer, isn't it? And I don't think it's wrong to say, God, we want to see revival. But it's, it's, it's a very big prayer. And as I say, it's right to pray it, but it's, it's, it's almost so big, so almost nebulous. Um, what's the first step to revival? Well, it may be something I've got to do. Uh, something God can use me to do, to maybe bring the good news of Jesus to my neighbor or to a friend. Maybe there's something that I can do as the first step. And Nehemiah's first step to the revival, the recovery, the restoration, is to go and have a conversation with the king, who I won't tell you what happens in chapter two, in case you haven't got it there, but the king 
has the power and authority to maybe release Nehemiah to begin a great project. And so it's, it, it's just one little step at a time. He's not even saying, God, bless my project. God, um, I've got in mind, I've got a heart to go and build the walls myself. The specific thing is the next thing, the first step. Give me favor. Give me success today. I'm going to take my courage in my hands. I'm going to trust God. And I'm going to speak up. And I realize it's high risk. You, you've got to be careful what you say to a king, uh, particularly if you're not even uh, his nationality, but you've come uh, in exile from Jerusalem. Uh, but he's going to take his courage in his hand. He's going to trust God and say, God, please help me to say something. And as we'll see when we come to chapter two, that prayer is. Heard. But the prayer, the immediate first step is a conversation with the king. The whole dream could be shut down in a moment if it goes badly. That could be the end of Nehemiah's dream to see Jerusalem and the walls rebuilt and the people rebuilt. It could be the end of Nehemiah. It could go badly if he speaks out of turn. His job is to, to bear the cup. Um, uh, some people have seen it as quite a significant job that maybe he's even the, the, the one to make sure the king is not being poisoned or even perhaps the, the taster to make sure uh, it's safe. Um, but he, the point is he's close in location, in proximity to, to the king. Uh, but it's not normal for him to strike up a conversation and say, shall we talk about politics or the weather or anything else? Uh, how will he get to speak? And so his prayer is, God, give me success. And so the pattern of the prayer is, is got a lot to teach us about prayer. Remembering who God is builds our faith. Uh, being ready to pray in that lamenting way, to pray with repentance, but to remember and to quote scripture in our prayers. God, I remember that you said this. God, I remember that promise. I'm holding on to that promise. And God, you know what's on my heart, but really it's about the next five minutes or the next 10 minutes or the next next bit of the plan for me. Yes, send revival, but help me even with the next conversation with my workmate or my colleague or my, my neighbor. Prayer brings us closer to God. Prayer brings us into the heart of God. And that's what I, I liked about those comments I read from Tom Wright about as we lament, we are lamenting with God. If we are upset about, for example, the issue I shared of serious youth violence, how much more is God's heart broken? How much more is uh, God weeping with those who weep? As we pray, as we lament, so we enter into the heart of God and we are strengthened. And it's not a matter of twisting God's arm or forcing his hand, but actually we're the ones who come into line with his will. Let's take a moment of quiet and I'll lead us in prayer. Father, remember that in the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, uh, we pray your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Uh, and Lord, it's often through prayer that we perhaps discern a bit more what your will is. It's in prayer that we often discern a bit more uh, how you feel, uh, how you see things. Uh, it's not that we're forcing you to see things our way, but we come closer into line with uh, an understanding of of your purposes for our lives and for others. Father, we pray that uh, we might uh, be able to pray simply pouring out our heart to you over the things which grieve and hurt and sadden us, but that we might not stay in that place, that we might be able to come with confidence and faith, remembering who you are, your promises, and uh, we might be able to bring to you each step uh, of the day. Lord, you know the things we're doing tomorrow. You know the things we're 
planning, you'll know the things which perhaps we are dreading or the conversation we've got to, to start with somebody, the things we've got to bring up um, with our neighbours or family or workmates, whatever it may be. And we pray like Nehemiah, grant us success in the conversation with this man, whoever this man or woman may be uh, for us. Uh, Lord, teach us to pray, teach us to walk with you, teach us to uh, understand your will and purposes for our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. We have an opportunity to keep reflecting on God's word to us uh, as we sing again. So Alistair and the others are going to lead us in song. Let's stand and sing Everyone Needs Compassion. do be seated as we come to a time of prayer.
Father God, we thank you. Lord, that even in situations that appear to be hopeless, where there is um, a sense of despair, Lord, we thank you that even those situations are not beyond the reach of your grace and your love and your comfort. And Lord, I thank you as well. We thank you that you know each of our hearts and you know the sorrows just as you knew the sorrow that weighed on Nehemiah. So you know the sorrows and the things that weigh on each one of us. Lord, thank you that if we turn to you in prayer, you will be attentive. You will hear our prayers, Lord, and you will respond. And so, Lord, we pray that you would give us faith now as we pray for the world and for ourselves. Lord, would we trust that you hear my voice and that you see each of our hearts. Lord, and that you are, you are mighty and strong. You are able to make known your salvation. Lord, give us hope as we pray. Father God, this evening we do pray for situations in the world where there is great grief and sorrow. Lord, we pray for the situation in Ethiopia, for the civil war that is happening there, where there's been great violence, loss of life. Lord, we pray for your mercy in that situation. Lord, we pray for the church in Ethiopia. We pray that you would enable people to hold on to you and to bear witness to your love in the midst of great turmoil and suffering. And Lord, we also pray for the situation in Ukraine. Lord, for another atrocity in the news today, the bombing of a school. Lord, we know that day by day the losses, those who have been bereaved, Lord, all, all this suffering mounts up each day. Lord, we pray for your mercy. We pray that the suffering will be brought to a conclusion, Lord. We pray that a time of restoration would not be far off. Lord, we pray for other situations of conflict in the world. We pray for your mercy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, as we've seen uh, the, the video this evening, Lord, we do recognize the, the great loss of life that there has been in our own city in recent years to needless violence. And Lord, we pray as your people, we pray for your mercy on young people in our city, for those who are currently connected and involved in gangs, for those who are tempted to be drawn into violence. Lord, we thank you uh, for the work of Synergy, for this network of churches and Christians who are working together to do all they can to bring hope and meaning to the lives of young people in this city and to reverse um, the things that's loss of life. We pray for Synergy. We pray for all the different groups and churches who are involved in that work. We pray that through them, your light would shine into, the, some of the, into some of the dark places of this city. We pray that lives would be changed and that lives would be saved. And as we pray for young people in this city, we also pray for the work of Spear, beginning a new course, working with young people who are out of work, struggling to find a way through life. We pray for the young people who are part of the new course. We pray that through the next few weeks, they would grow in confidence and be given a hope for their lives and for the future. And Lord, we pray for young people in our city that there would be hope. Lord, in your mercy. 
And Lord, this evening, we also do pray for the life of our church community here at St. Mark's. Lord, we do want to pray uh, for our, our annual church meeting next week. And we pray, especially as, as there are opportunities for people to serve on the PCC, but also as there are many opportunities to serve in the life of our church. Lord, we pray uh, that where you are calling people to give of themselves, not just to serve in this church, but to serve in this church so that we can serve our community. Lord, we pray that people would respond to your calling. People would be willing to hear your voice and respond to the things that you're asking them to do. And Lord, we pray uh, that you would keep blessing the life of this church. Lord, that you would renew us, renew our strength, that we might serve you. And especially as we recognize the challenges of this time, Lord, we pray that you would enable us to bear a light to your love to those around us. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, as we are looking at the life of Nehemiah, we just pray for each one. We pray for ourselves, Lord. We pray that you would help us to look to you with confidence. Lord, we ask that you would help us to be people of prayer, people for whom it is natural and normal to turn to you to remember your goodness, your greatness, and then to share with you the things that trouble us, but also to ask for your help, not just that you would change things, but that you would help us to bring something of your light to people. Lord, help us to be people of prayer. And Lord, for this week, pray that you would help us to turn to you each day. It may be that there are other people in situations that you would like to pray for this evening. Or we'll just have a moment of quiet to hold those things before God. Father God, we thank you that you hear our prayers and that you know our hearts. Lord, help us to keep looking to you. Amen. Amen. We have almost reached the conclusion um, of our service this evening. We are going to sing again uh, before we finish. Um, just to say, Steve, I don't know if there's anything you particularly wanted to share in terms of notices. Um, there is a notice sheet that hopefully... Uh, you've received on the way in. Uh, just to mention again that our annual church meeting will follow our morning service uh, next week. Um, and so if if you would like uh, to join, especially if I know we have um, some members of our evening congregation who are very regular in the evening, um, but if you would like to join for the annual meeting next week, please do. Uh, we'll be electing up to seven new members of the PCC. Um, and so if you'd be interested uh, in serving in that way, then do uh, grab myself or maybe Steve after the service um, and otherwise um, I'll, I'll leave you to look through uh, the other events and things that are coming up uh, on the notice sheet and also just to say thank you again uh, to those there's a few amens coming in uh, and a good evening also so from Rita and Audley uh, are sending their greetings to everyone um, so thank you to Rita and Audley for joining us online and uh, to others who may have been following the service um, it's good it's good to have had you with us we are going to stand and sing our final song together. Um, and after the service, if you'd like to leave a, leave a gift at the back, there's a, there's a basket to leave a gift as well. And we'll share some refreshments also. But let's stand and sing our final song.
Thank you again for being here this evening and again please do stay for refreshments after the service lord god we thank you so much for this time together lord we pray that your spirit would be with each one of us as we go from this place may you be with us this week may we look to you this week may we know your presence and love uh, guiding us and strengthening us through the coming days and the blessing of god almighty the father the son and the holy spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen.